I wonder if they want to see us. Hmm. Yeah, I probably should let them see us. Hey, hey, hey. Coming to you very shortly. All right. Da, 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 da. If you're listening to this on the podcast and I left this in, well, you know, I guess I must have been lazy that day. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it happens. <laughs> da, 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 da. Ta, 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 da, 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 da. Hey, 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 Cindy Lou from the Be Bold You podcast. And the singing, that's me. <clears throat> that's all me. And that is being boldly me. And I want you to be bold too. And today I have an amazing guest with me, Terry Healy, who definitely is in her second chapter of life and rebuilding her life or rebuilt her life and reinvented it and is helping communities to do amazing things that impact a bunch of people. And we're going to hear a little bit, I'm going to ask her a little bit about her backstory, kind of what brought her to this point of wanting to help communities. And then we're just going to get to know her because you guys know people do podcasts. Part of it is I want you to get to know the people and know a little more about them because not all podcasts do that. Some of them are just not us. Here we are having fun. So in case you've never listened to this podcast before, my name is Cindy Lou. I'm the creator and founder of the Be Bold You Personality Expression System, the author of the Becoming Bold You book, which explains about the Be Bold You Personality Expression System, because you might not know about such a thing. And the premise of that is, is that we all get to choose who we are in the world and who we become. We do not have to let the yesterday say who we are today, nor do we have to let a description of some assessment, which I'm obsessed with, by the way, I love assessments and I take lots of them. And for a while, I would let the description define what I would do in life. Oh, it says I'm this, so I must act this way. No, you don't have to act that way. If you don't like something on that description, cross that baby off. You do not have to go that road. So each of us also is an individual person. There are as many personalities on the planet as there are people. Yes, there may be four basic types in any assessment that you take or 16 or nine, depending on the assessment you take. However, you are an individual with experiences, education, a point of view, a family makeup, the country you were born in, everything about you helps to define who you are, which is why I say there are as many personalities on the planet as there are people. So I love using this show and this platform to bring you some of those people and introduce you to their personalities and their fun way of being in this world. So welcome, Terry. I would love for you to introduce yourself a little bit more. I know you're a speaker and you help these communities, but please tell us a little more about yourself. Thank you. Uh, well, and first, let me say how grateful I am for the opportunity to be on your podcast. It's always wonderful. And who knows, you know, where the connections lead. And I believe in my world, everyone who hears this is exactly who's supposed to be hearing all this. So thank you for the opportunity to be here and share. Um, so yeah, I do speak internationally and I coach a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of executives and a little bit of a niche with real estate agents because I've sold real estate for a number of years. Um, and I'm in the midst of writing my first book. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that and, and I have to stay disciplined every day. I've got to hit the clock and say, I'm going to devote a certain amount of time to this. Um, I found out in COVID that I could actually write because all of my speaking engagements were going, again, going south, you know, no one was, uh, no one was going to be completing those. And so I kind of thought, well, you know, you need a punt. So I took a little course and found out that I could write and I've uh, been published in about five magazines now. So that's kind of exciting. Yeah. A little awesome. Hit of yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you're building yourself an audience before you even get your first book out. That's great. Uh, yeah, I think so. Probably. It's good. Probably like a backward way of how, how things are. They tell us to market now is probably not the trajectory that I'm on. So I tend to tend to march to a different drummer usually. So that's normal. I think you're actually marketing the way that is smart um, to kind of build that audience ahead of time and then launch a book to an audience that's ready for hearing more about what you've got to say. Yeah, I and, think the, and the hope somebody would go, oh, oh, I've heard that name before. Yeah, she's mm -hmm. got a profound story or something to give me, something of value. So, so I have these ten questions that I uh, ask for okay. all of my guests, and the first one is, 
What is your favorite color? Blue. Blue. And are you introverted or extroverted? Absolutely extroverted, without question. <laughs> Absolutely extroverted. You are one of the few yeah. guests that I get on the show that are actually extro extroverted. Isn't that strange? That is. That's backward. A lot of my guests are introverts. Oh, I don't know okay. if I find them and like bring them out and I'm like, they're feeling yeah. like they can be comfortable around me or what. But yeah, I, I like draw them out. <laughs> it's quite fun. Uh, what quote or phrase encourages you the most? Everything that happens to me is the best possible thing that can happen to me. Oh my gosh, I love that quote. Mm -hmm. Everything that happens to me is the best possible thing that can happen to me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's I don't know, personal. I'm thinking of some of my everythings. Mm -hmm. And it's so, like, oof. So what it, what it does is it doesn't negate what might have been challenging in a situation. But what it does do is it makes you focus for that one small nugget of gold because there is something like that in absolutely everything. So it just, it, it kind of focuses you toward that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I'm going to have to ponder on that one for a mm -hmm. bit. <laughs> <laughs> what energizes you? Dancing. Dancing. What kind of dancing do you do? Uh, it's kind of like freestyle, you know, when you just get up and you're hearing live music and and, uh, and I'm usually like the first person to hit a dance floor. So out in my communities, um, I've done that for a couple of years. The bands now they'll find me and they'll ask me to come out because they know that, that I get the party started and people are always very comfortable to come up and dance with me. So that's, yeah, that's my life. That's, yeah, that feeds my soul. It really inspires people when we are willing to get out there and dance. And it, and the people that it inspires the most is actually the band because yes. they know you're enjoying the music. Yes. They, yes. Like it feeds them. It energizes them. It makes their performance better. Well, and, and I, one, one thing that one of them had told me and I didn't understand until he said it is how, how it feels for them when they're up and they're bringing their talents and their gifts to us. And we're sitting off on the side on our phones. And I was like, oh, my goodness, how 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 dishonoring is that? You know, so I'm mm -hmm. very aware of that. Can I tell you a quick story about dancing while we're on that yes. question? Okay, you good. Can. So, That's why I ask these questions because oh. I get stories. <laughs> so I was um, out at an outdoor festival and it was like crazy hot. It was like almost 100 degrees. And there was a band on the stage playing a lot of 70s music, which we don't hear a lot. You know, we don't get that disco kind of thing. Well, it was the middle of the song and this woman came up and she started dancing with me and she's grinning from ear to ear and I'm grinning from ear to ear. And we just, we were having a blast. And the next thing I know, I, you know, look off to the side, her daughter's taking a video of us with the phone and she starts to do the bump with me. And I'm like, the bump, oh, I haven't bumped in forever, right? So, and so the song ends and I looked at her and I said, oh my goodness, I had so much fun with you. Come and find me. I want to dance with you again before the band's done. And all of a sudden her son came up from behind her and he grabbed her elbow. Her whole face just dropped and he said, mom, it's time to go. She never spoke and her daughter came up and said, thank you so much. Our mother, we brought her out for the Sunday to hear the band. She has dementia. We haven't seen her dance in 20 years. Aww. And I was like, and I just cried. And I said, do you thank your mother for me? Because she gave me a gift today. So that's my, my, one of my favorite stories about being out and dancing. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm tearing up now. Right. For those yeah. who are watching, you get to see it. But for those who are like listening, oh my gosh, I'm sure you're tearing up too. Yeah. Same. I love that. That is so precious. We just don't know. We do not know what a little thing like dancing can do. Right. Yeah. I think I've told my dancing story before. I came out of the I came out of the bathroom at Dartmouth College and I did a little pirouette and I almost ran into one of the professors. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. He's like, well, having a good day, are we? I was like, yes, I yeah, am. Thank absolutely. You very much. <laughs> that was the sign. <laughs> what has been your favorite age? Oh, my current, 56. Every year, it's a real strange. It's like every year gets better and better. So I don't mind aging. I'm actually get excited. And so I'm 
anticipating being 57 in October thinking, gee, I wonder what's going to come up for me at age 57. Yes, I'm finishing age 58. I will be 59 in July. So, oh, yeah, coming closer birthday. to the 60. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for the happy birthday. Yes, it's about a month away. And are you a book listener or, I mean, a book reader or a song listener? Both, both. So it, um, both, actually, but probably more songs than books. I have been listening to a lot of podcasts lately the past few months. So I don't know what, what that falls under, but kind of maybe something in the middle. Yeah, it is kind of something in the middle. So is there a song that you would say everybody should hear this song or an artist that you really love and either have seen or want to go see? Oh, my goodness. Um, boy, you know what? It's interesting. The person I'd really want to go see is Bette Midler. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of all people, because I'm like, she just looks like a hoot, you know, number one. And then just all that all that vibrancy and the humor and everything. So that would, that's on my bucket list. So hopefully she'll... She'll be touring when I can go find her. Her energy is amazing. It is. It is. What is the most exotic place you've ever visited? Brazil. Brazil. I think mm -hmm. I've heard that one recently. So what did you love most about it? There was um, there was a church that we saw when we were touring Brasilia, which is the capital. And it's made up, made completely of handmade blue stained glass. So when you walk in and you see the sunlight coming through this glass, it was it was indescribable. And there's small pieces of glass. It wasn't like great big sheets of it. So uh, just it was just incredible. The just the feeling that you got being in that in that light and in that energy was indescribable. Mm, sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. Do you create to live or live to create? I, I live to create. Yeah. <laughs> I love that you knew that answer so quickly. It's like, I live to create, <laughs> period. Um, who's been the greatest influence on your life and they can be dead or alive? I would have to say Oprah. That's probably a common okay. one, right? Yeah. Actually, yeah. you know, the most common one is my parents. Oh. That's what people say. My mama, oh. my dad. Oh. I'm amazed at how many people. I would hope my children would say that of me. <laughs> right? I know. I'm like... <laughs> And, and when, when they say that, I say, now that is, you know, reminder to the mamas that are watching, super important. But yeah. I also want to say with Oprah, reminder that you cannot set it too big. Like right. you can be inspired by somebody that is bigger than you are and grab a hold of that and run with it. Yeah, she's definitely on my list of people that have inspired me. Um, I always wanted to be on the Oprah show. Same. So <laughs> Super Soul Sunday, maybe sometime. Mm -hmm. It's not over. My life's not over. So I may make it there yet. Right. And she's still doing it. So. <laughs> right. And and this these days it could be a virtual visit and I would be cool with that. Absolutely. So. Yeah. OK, let's see. Last question. What one word describes you best? Right now it's peace. Oh, love mm -hmm. it. That's super exciting. It's, it's different. It's a very different sensation for me. And it's been, I've been, I've held that for a couple of months now running. And I, so I'm always going, oh my gosh, I feel just feel so peaceful. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. All right. So now we're on to that. I ask all my guests, <clears throat> if I can only ask you one question, what would it be? And this is the question you gave me. What inspired you to create your message and the need to help out the community? Well, to answer that question, I'm going to drop into my backstory and give you a little bit of a history of where I came from and where that came from. So, you know, my history was one of some profound abuse. And the pinnacle of it was uh, when I was 12, I was actually abandoned in a mobile home. And I was left there without uh, any adults present. Uh, there wasn't food. There, I didn't have clean clothing. Um, utilities were spotty. You know, sometimes I would have heat and sometimes I wouldn't and sometimes electricity and sometimes not. So what I had to do and, and the choices that I had to make with the, with the wherewithal I had and the abilities I had at that age were, were pretty heartbreaking. Um, and I remember 
one time being just profoundly hungry and uh, walking to a grocery store quite a ways away. I didn't have enough money to really buy anything to eat. So I stole a package of hot dogs. And I remembered walking out of that grocery store and I thought, I'm never going to do that again. I mean, the feeling of the feeling of guilt and everything was overwhelming. So I thought that's, that's uh, not in my radar. I'm going to have to figure something else out. Um, right around that time too was a time that people were looking at me as a possible babysitter for their kids. So I started to babysit for families in this trailer park that I lived in. And there, um, there was a one night when, um, the mom didn't come home to pay me, but the dad did. And he said to me, I've got your money. Uh, I've got a little extra if you want it. And I knew what he, I knew what he wanted. I knew what he, he was talking about. And, uh, because again, because of all the history that I had. So, um, so I, I took advantage of that because I really needed that money. And so that's how I survived for just about three years that I was there. Um, I would go from trailer to trailer and that's what I did. That's what was available to me. So there was, um, one night that I was in the trailer and there was a really, really bad storm outside. And if you've ever lived in a mobile home, it's, uh, the noise is magnified. So it got really scary. And all I thought was, oh my goodness, you know, I could die here tonight and no one would know that I was here. And immediately I had to let go of the fear because the fear was just not in my I couldn't allow it. I didn't have any space for it. I couldn't have survived if I was like really in touch with that feeling. So I went from that moment into being real angry with God. And um, it just hit me like, how could there be a God that I had an understanding of that would ever have allowed the circumstances that I was surviving? And I made a decision in that moment that there was no God. And honestly, couldn't I couldn't say the word God until I was 47 years old because I was just that mad, you know. And so um, right after that, it was like I heard a voice and it was a weird sensation because it wasn't like a voice in my head and it, it was nobody else there but me. And this voice said to me, just get through this. Everything that you've experienced and lived through, you've needed, and you're here to touch hundreds of thousands of lives. So I took that message and I kind of tucked it away and I didn't tell anybody about it, like till in my mid forties actually. Um, but that message came to me, it was almost like that was what kept me sane and had me survive and then once I got out of there, you know, once the authorities came and took, took me out, um, it was what gave me the mission to become healthy and to heal the damage, you know, because a lot of damage had been done by that time, and to become the best that I could be because I had, I had something to do. You know, it's like I, there, was, there was a higher purpose to my being. And so I've always, always been looking for, you know, what's the next gift that I need to find and give and and all of that good stuff. So that's that's really where I think that my my passion to helping other people comes from that. You know, there's something about, you know, when you survive certain things in your life that are profoundly challenging, that you can do a few different things with that. You know, you can you can choose to um, become a victim of it, you know, and uh, let it keep you small for the rest of your life. Let it become that conversation or that crutch for that. Or you can decide that um, you're going to overcome it and become even better, a better person, whatever that means to you because of it. Or you can maybe do something in the middle. But I think that, I think that if you're not completely dropped into the victim mentality there, what comes out of those of those situations is a profound compassion for other human beings because you've experienced it. It's almost like there's a knowing there's a, you know, it's like when you see another woman who's been through or going through something that, that you've experienced and your heart just 
goes there because you've lived it and you got it, you know, so just my philosophy on it. I love it. Thank you. <sighs> yeah. Uh, and how people get into situations is different for everybody. Mm -hmm. I think almost everybody has some situation though, at some point in their life that they've been in that wasn't their choice. As far as yes. it wasn't their first choice. Correct. Or a conscious choice, you know? And it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you on that. I agree with you on that. Yeah. Like it wasn't on their to-do list. Let me rephrase that. It wasn't on their to-do list, right? I, like it wasn't yeah. on the conscious. Here are the things I would like to do in life. Like mm -hmm. abortion was not on my to-do list. Right. Marrying and divorcing that man, not on my list. <laughs> oh yeah. Getting married, being married for 20 years. Yes. Yes. And then divorced. Yes. Not on my to-do list. list. No. Of course, neither was moving to New Zealand, although it did go down my to-do list about 10 years before I moved here. However, it still wasn't really when I was a kid on my to-do list. So some of the good things that happened to us are not on our to-do list either. Sure. Consciously, at some point in our lives, we have to shift them into the to-do list, don't we? Yeah. To get them to, to get to shift. I'm taking what you said earlier about everything that happens to us is the best thing that could happen to us. If we take what's happened to us and we realize what we can and can't do with that, and then we shift that into, well, that changed this about my life, but now what does that mean that I can do? Because me, that yes. happened. Yes. Agreed. If, if you choose to, if you choose to look at it like that. So that's the, I think that's the, that's the path of least resistance is to say, how am I going to make use of this conversation? So, you know, when I, when I first started to speak, um, that, uh, you know, it wasn't coming out and getting paid engagements like I'm grateful for and blessed with today. And I, I used to go into, um, into Gary, Indiana, and I used to go into the homeless shelters and the better women shelters. And, and I would go into different places and that's how I honed my speaking craft. And, um, can I tell you another story? Yes. <laughs> okay. So you can. this is, this is, a, this is a cool story. This was, um, Someone had brought me in to speak to parents that were court mandated to go through parenting classes by the city of Gary. So it's, it's a rougher community, you know, and um, and they weren't major infractions. It was like, you know, truancy or curfew violation sort of violations. So uh, I would go into this room and the um, everyone in the room was very hostile. They didn't know what I was doing there. They didn't want to hear anything about what I had to say. And uh, what I know is that when I start to speak, um, people usually get engaged pretty quickly, you know, and their guards drop and they realize, you know, is, is I'm, a, I'm as probably as authentic as they come and mean no one any harm. So um, every time before I would go and speak there, I would get be in the car and, and I'd be waiting, used to be escorted back and forth to the building. It was that, that rough there, right? Wow. Yeah. So I would sit in the car and I would think, you know, this is what I want to speak on today. I've never met these people before. And then I would go in and it was just, usually I would speak on something I couldn't even have imagined would come out of my mouth. So the last time that I was there, there was a woman and she stayed till the class was over and everybody had left. And, and she came up to me and she said, um, she asked if I remembered her. And I said, gosh, you know what? I'm so sorry. I don't recall. I said, where, where did I meet you? And she said, well, you know, I was here a few months ago and I heard you talk. And um, if so, I was thinking, oh, my goodness, she got snagged again. You know, one of her kids did something. And, and uh, she said, you know, I finished the class and I showed up at court with my certificate of completion. And she said, I told the judge I wanted to come through the class again because I wanted to hear Miss Terry speak. And he said that he would allow that. And... Um, I had found out in, hind in hindsight that she had no transportation, which was real common in this community. So she was walking back and forth to all the classes to get to the last class to hear me speak. So almost two miles each way, this gal was trucking it, right? So she said, um, I don't remember what you talked about. She said, but what I knew was a couple days after I heard you talk, I realized that all I was ever doing was screaming at my kids. And she said, Miss Terry, I stopped hollering at my kids. She, Can I show you my kids? And I'm like, mm-hmm. So she pulls out her phone and she shows me this 
this little little girl, you know, and she says, this is my girl. And and she says, you know, I was always on her because she had her books and her colors and her crayons and her mess all over. And, and I said, when I stopped screaming about the mess, she says, Miss Terry, my girl's an artist. And she says, here's my boy. And she says, now I know my boy's really smart in math. And I was telling mom, I think we're going to have somebody graduate high school for the first time in our Yay. family. And so, like, what a gift, right? That this woman was so vulnerable with me. And um, she thanked me. And so they escorted me back to my car. And I sat in the car and I just sobbed. And I got it. You know, I just, what I saw was that I'd spoken months prior. The topic was shame, of all things. I spoke on shame. That woman's life changed from something she heard. Her children's lives changed. Who they couple with and how they do that changed. If they parent their conversations, those children's conversations, everybody's lives. I just, I saw the whole pyramid like it was clear as day. And that was the day when I sat in that car, I knew that this is what I needed to do for a living. This is this was this was the connection. This was that message I got in that trailer in the middle of the storm. That mm -hmm. this was this was it, and and I needed to to get it together so that I was out there impacting lives, and I needed to do it where I was making money, and it wasn't just a thing for volunteering. So um, yeah, that's my story. Thank you for letting me share that. Oh one. my gosh, I love that. Yeah, it was incredible. What a gift! What a gift that woman gave me, and you know, unfortunately because of the cultural differences, I couldn't really hug her. I couldn't cry in front of her, though now every time I feel the story, I start to cry again. Um, but, you know, somewhere out in the ether, she's got my, she's got my eternal gratitude for what she did for me that day. And she has no idea. None. What she did for you and how None. many more people yes. are being impacted now because she came back to tell you that. Absolutely. Yeah, because I probably, I don't know that I ever, well, maybe possibly, but it might have taken longer for me to hit the ejector button on my behind to go, okay, wait a second, this should be your livelihood. Go out there and do it. So so you have three things. Here's the, I want to talk about these three things because you have these three things and they, they were kind of what jumped out at me. So you guys know that I just go scouring the websites or whatever they give me and I look at things and kind of come up with something that I want to ask them about. So I want you to talk about these three and just expand a little on this. So here's the first one. Helping people create extraordinary lives. What does that mean to you? What that means to me is that we're all extraordinary. And whether or not we're in touch with that, we are. I think that, you know, one of the things that is coming up and out of me now, what's kind of what, what I've arrived at in my 50s, um, is that we are taught to chase what I call these outer winds, you know. We go running around thinking that, you know, more money or education or a better body or younger looking skin or any of that stuff is what is what makes our lives complete. And what I know is that, you know, we all of us have achieved great things, right? And it, we still are typically left with a sense of vacancy. You know, there's something else that's missing and we don't know what that is. And all of that's good. So I don't discount any of that. But there's also something that I'm defining as our inner winds. And we are not taught to focus on it, let alone how to figure out what those are. But I know that as I've worked with people from stages and in coaching, um, that once we can kind of get under those layers of those external winds and someone can get present to the fact of who they truly are, you know, and that, that, that that's, nobody can impact it, not even themselves can change who you truly are and the essence of you, um, that that's when people start to step into what is their extraordinary. And it's different for everyone. And, and you know, there's no, there's no qualifying it. There's no ranking it of any ones being any better than the others. But that that would be my explanation of that.
And the next one is, my life is a story of transformation. So are you saying that all of our lives are a story of transformation or you're just talking about your life being a story of transformation? My life is a story of transformation. And I tell people that and I put that out there like that because what what I want people to understand is that is that transformation is is without question possible. And sometimes you don't even have to be seeking it, but it I think it helps to know where someone's coming from. So that's that's why I put that out in using that kind of languaging is that is that you know if you when you start to understand everything well, not even everything, but some of the more profound things that that I've survived and who I've become on the other side of it. It's just it's it defies all odds. So statistically, I should I don't even know that I should be alive in my fifties, to be honest. But I should have had a life of addiction and um, solicitation. You know, I should have been trafficking. You know, um, all kinds of things should have happened to me that didn't and. So it took a transformation and a lot of a lot of choosing that to become who I am to do the work that I'm here to do. Yes. <laughs> and you did st- share your story earlier for those who maybe didn't catch the beginning of that show and they're watching this live. You'll have to go back and listen to it for those who were distracted at the beginning of this show and you're wa- listening to the podcast. I guess you'll have to go back and listen to it, too. Right. So I saw this one, this line committed to impacting 10 million lives. That is a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. Tell me about this for you and what this means. Well, it's interesting because, you know, that that messaging that I got in the storm, it was hundreds of thousands of lives. So that was the that was the 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 definer for all those years of my life. And recently, like in the last year um, that that became 1 million lives. Like I was just kind of had this knowing, oh, this is funny, that I wanted to impact 1 million lives. So I actually started keeping an Excel spreadsheet and I would write down when I would, you know, go speak. And so, you know, maybe I'd speak to 1500 women. Well, you know, that's, that's touching 1500 lives, you know, whether or not they put it in their back pocket and open it later, or they're getting the, getting their messaging right then and there that it, it, it is touching lives. And, so just recently I um, was in Clubhouse and uh, I was in a room with someone and he messaged me off the room and he said, he said, I don't know you, but what I do know is I know people and I think you're playing small. And, and, and what he said, which was pretty profound was, was that whole conversation of when, like when I spoke to that woman in the parenting class and, and how I impacted her life and her children and so on and so on is he said what what you have to be very aware of and intentional about is that you know the people you touch are going to touch others and touch others and touch others will i personally touch 10 million lives probably not will my messaging i certainly hope so i love it love it love it love it all right so can you tell the story that you told before when we were off about the newest one? Are you allowed to share about that or can you not? Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Is this about the one that the project that we're just starting to work yes. on? Okay. Yes, your yes. newest project. Can you yes, share about that? Because I really, really, really want people to share, to yes. hear about it because it was super, super exciting. Thanks. And maybe it is going to be fun, like pulling, pulling it all together. So there is... Um, there's a doctor in my community that I met when I used to host a radio show and uh, he and I are just like-minded, like-spirited and uh, he's a, a force to be reckoned with in the community and we do some some pretty big things out there together and uh, so recently I was just thinking I need we need the next thing you know we just completed something with the homeless people in our in our community and we need the next thing to focus on and so um, I'd shown up at the Y for a brand new class and uh, the instructor had a canvas bag and on the bag it it uh it had her logo for it said kelly's kindness and i caught you know, i caught it in my eye and i thought you know i wonder what that's about because there's always a curiosity for me when when people are doing things of service like what's the backstory of that you know um and she got up to teach the te- to teach the class and before she started she said to all of us she said i just want you all to know this is the six month anniversary of my daughter passing away 
so the room you know got a little quiet and there were people in the room that knew her so they were you know commiserating and consoling her a little bit but um after the class i went up to her and i just said you know I'm, thank you for telling me that and uh, but i'm very curious what it, what is this all about and so what she shared was that her daughter um had passed away not from suicide but her um sister had come home for a college break and the first night they were out driving around you know and uh going out for ice cream and so she had asked her sister to hold her ice cream cone and the little girl had put her head out the window and closed her eyes to let the breeze go through, you know, and that that was a way that she could help manage her anxiety, which was pretty profound. So she had a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, um, anxiety to the point that she was pulling her own hair out of her head. Wow. Yeah. And so in that moment, she's feeling the breeze and the sister is navigating the roads and the steering wheel and she's navigating with two ice cream cones in her hands. She went off the road and the, a pole hit a pole and that pole hit the girls, hit the girl and she ended up passing mm. away from that experience. So the little girl was one of the other ways that she would decompress was through art. So the, this is a brand new 501c3. And so what they're doing and they've done is they've brought uh, art and and that gift to communities and children that don't have access to it out here in our area. And, they, and then recently they just did a scholarship, a $1,500 scholarship for one of those children. So um, this doctor is just a good, really cool person, but he is the president of the Indian American Medical Association out here. And they have quite a conversation of wanting their children under that community to give back. So I thought, well, not interesting, right? Let's connect the dots, right? We've got all these kids that are just itching to be of contribution and service. And here we've got something that's kind of pointed at other kids and from, unfortunately, the loss of, of someone that they would probably identify with. Yeah. Uh, our children passing catapults us into things we never imagined we would do. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter was an abortion that I had, but that's still a daughter passing. Sure. Um, there was still all the healing that I had to go through and all of the, you know, um, and there's a compassion that I have for women who have done that and not really realize what they were doing or have done it out of where I was at, which is what I thought I was going to um, be killed it, it, essentially um, I thought the father would be there trying to kill me and so I wasn't thinking straight and I was not you know I did something I wasn't on my to-do list um, but it was on my in that moment felt the necessary list so that it just I realized that people do things sometimes out of not thinking in their right mind and I have so much more grace towards people. And I think that confuses some because I'm so forgiving. Mm -hmm. Yet it is what allows for me to love on people that are unlovable um, in so many ways. So I'm not even sure why I'm sharing that, but I must be for somebody. Um, and then I've had two other women that I'm kind of working with one of them, she does a Hope to Hope conference every year. Her son was killed in a um, hunting accident when he was 14. Oh. Yeah. So out with family, you know, hunting accident. You get it. <laughs> I don't need to say any more than that. So he was 14 and he was killed in a hunting accident. She does this Hope to Hope conference where every year she's just bringing words of hope and things and that was in his memory and then I don't know if you've met Janetta yet on Clubhouse yeah so Janetta has Jenny's day Jenny's yes. and she's doing a Jenny's world day which is October 10th 2021 is going to be the second one last year was her first one that was the 10 year anniversary was last year and then this is so it's 2020 I think it's her 10 year anniversary oh I'm not 100% sure on that anyway Jenny died when she was 16 and it was from suicide and it was after a huge fight with her mama. And so um, what it did though, was it allowed Janetta to now 
seek out and learn how to help parents to talk to their kids when they don't want to talk to you, to navigate through all of those things. And on Clubhouse, we're going to be doing a 24-hour celebration where we have um, artists and performers coming and sharing their gifts. And it's going to start on 1010 at 10 a.m. in New Zealand. I'm going to be the first host oh. of the first hour. And I'm actually coordinating the whole 24 hours and making sure that everything's filled up. So these things that that parents like, you, you know, this woman, you know, Kelly or uh, Kelly was the daughter's name, right? You know? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, they, their children live on through what parents are doing. Right? What, I guess what we parents are doing, I guess Cheryl Elizabeth is also living on through what I'm doing, which is bringing awareness to the fact that, that mental wellness, mental stress that can happen after the death of a child or, or some traumatic experience, which both, that was both of mine <laughs> kind of combined into one, um, you know, whether you've got some super traumatic thing or whether you've been through the death of a child, which is a super traumatic thing, the emotional strain that can come there is real. Finding ways that we can celebrate life still is super important. And that's the focus that it's going to be on the clubhouse one. Then she's going to have some that are live streamed on social media that are going to be the conversations with professionals and, you know, getting help and how to do that. So it's really, really exciting to be yes. doing this. And, and I would love to talk with you more about maybe helping me with that because you sound like you've done a lot of things with community and this is mm -hmm. kind of new for me, this whole stepping into this area of, um, yeah, <laughs> I do love the clubhouse world though. And the clubhouse community and, um, Same. that clubhouse nation is now over, I think 20 million. So oh, wow. there's a lot globally. Yeah. Globally. India has come on recently in very big numbers. So a lot of the new people that you see on there are probably from India. So it's pretty amazing. Um, loving it, loving what I'm doing there. Uh, loving connecting with people, helping people get started on there, jump starting there. So that is my little ad for today. It's usually sponsored by my book, The Becoming Bold Jew, but maybe it's sponsored by my uh, clubhouse mechanic. No. So this is sponsored by Becoming Bold Jew, which is my book. If you haven't gotten it yet, you should go get it. Go to Amazon and look it up. Um, you can find it and I can put it in the links. So now back to my guest. We want to make sure that you can connect with her afterwards. Um, but one of my listeners before we go there says, so freaking cool. What a beautiful way to remember and grieve and live with the memory of someone loved and no longer here. Yeah, it's so, yeah. so true. So, so true. All right. If people want to catch up with you, the, your website is super easy for them to get to. It's terryhealy.com, your name. And then your Instagram, which I find to be a fun one, digging for your gold. I'm going to ask you that one more question. This is going to wrap up with this one. So her Instagram is digging for your gold. And we're going to find out what that means right now before we go. Um, and then we're going to head on out of here. So please tell us, what does digging for your gold mean to you? Because it could mean a bunch of different things. <laughs> Indeed it can. <laughs> and it, my daughter says it sounds, sounds kind of gold diggerish, mom. She's going <laughs> to change that. But, um, no, for me, what it means is that is that I have never met anyone in all the walks and all the places I've gone that doesn't have some sort of gold within them. And, you know, unfortunately, when, when life our experiences are what they are and uh, how we process all that is what it is. We get a lot of dirt and uh, that if you make a commitment to go dig for your goal, you will. And if you put it out there with enough intention that you'll find your tools, you know, so sometimes you're, you're going to dig for your goal and you have a, you have a butter knife. Well, okay. Now you need a, maybe you need a pickaxe. You don't need a butter knife. Um, in my belief system, that if you set that intention, those tools will show up and you will do the work and you will excavate it. Um, one of the 
one of the gifts that I have and I'm very, very grateful for is that is that I can be in the presence and in conversation with almost anyone. And very quickly, I can see what their goal is. So what's really a lot of fun, and I do it, I do it everywhere I get a chance, uh, grocery store, gas station, whatever, I just start up, strike up a conversation and start talking to someone to see if they'll let me play and, and we can together start to excavate some of that. So um, yeah, that, that's that long-winded, long-winded explanation of digging for your gold. It was a perfect explanation of digging for your gold because it's yours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. I'm going to bring those three things back up here that are on your thing. And I would like you, to, as I bring each one up, just give us a quick little, what does this mean to you or what is it about? So that there's a little more to that. When they go to your site, they can see that and it'll trigger in their brains. All right. So here we go. Helping people create extraordinary lives means that each and every one of us are extraordinary and and it looks different and it may match what we see out in society and it may be something completely unique to ourselves but it's it's all it, it is probably in keeping with that conversation we're digging for your gold is that you know we don't often just get our extraordinary we have to seek it and find it um and sometimes we need people to facilitate that so that's what i like to do my life is a story of transformation um Again, defied odds of survival um, and becoming who I've become and have yet to become uh, is, is a complete and total example of transformation. Uh, there, I shouldn't be here today. I shouldn't be here serving and being who I am and, and all of that. It just, yeah. So I believe um, most people can come through transformation. I don't, believe, I don't know that of everyone, but yeah. Committed to impacting 10 million lives. So that was a gift from someone on Clubhouse to um, stop playing small was his challenge to me. And uh, the example that he told me was, doesn't mean you got to touch every single one of the lives that you want. It just means that when you touch someone, they touch someone and they touch someone and on and on and on. And if you make that commitment to impacting 10 million lives, that'll come. And I do believe this will come. Alrighty, freestyle, anything last that you want to tell them about your website, where they should go or anything they should do when they get there? You know, there's a, there's a contact page in there. Pop in. Um, I love having conversations with people. And, you know, I, I think a lot of us are, are approached with people going, oh, you know, book a book a time with me. And it has some sort of ulterior motive. It truly does not. There's there's a percentage of my days that I just dedicate toward helping and pouring into another human being. So pop in, set up a time, let's take 45 minutes, and maybe it's just that um, I can help someone see what their goal might be and to get them stimulated and send them off and running uh, with a virtual hug to go out and find their way. I love that. And, you know, there are times when pay is a, a, appropriate and there are times when we simply need to give and help another human being because we need to give. <laughs> and it's the right thing to do. And it's the purpose you're supposed to serve. Yes. You know. Yes. Thank you so much for being on um, with me today. I hope you have enjoyed yourself. I have enjoyed having you as a guest and I look forward to connecting with you more over on Clubhouse and probably here a bit more too, but definitely over on Clubhouse because that is where I'm living in case anybody's been wondering, where is this woman? She's been gone. She only shows up once a week now here. I am continuing to do these broadcasts every week and I will continue to do that. So until next week to my listeners, I say, um, uh, remember to live your life out loud and be bold you. Thank you so much. I've loved this. Yay.